All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to LARP as Art, High Concept Live Role Playing, and you. Uh, we're going to be introducing and discussing the concept of uh, live action role playing as an artistic form. We're looking at why you might want to do that, how you might be able to accomplish that from a design uh, perspective primarily, and uh, throwing in some examples from comparisons as well. Um, one question I did want to ask before we get started how many people here have done some live role playing before? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so some of this will be new, some of this will be um, stuff that you know already. Uh, we are going to presume a bit of a level of um, knowledge about the, the hobby and, and what it is. Sorry about because Live Role Playing 101 would be a panel in and of itself. This is the, the briefing again. I'm sure you all read it. It's, uh, but I'll, I'll read it again for the brief, you know, just so we're all across it. Uh, live action role playing is a lot of things to a lot of people hitting each other with foam swords, supernatural politics in the function room. Throwing dart guns at 50 bases, but what if it could be more? And, um, it's, uh, this is us. Proof that we're all hobbyists. But, um, and the question here, why are there four white dudes on this stage and who are they? Uh, so that comes to introductions. Uh, my name is Robert Anderson Hunt. Um, I'm one of the organizers of a game that we recently ran a while ago called Zeppelin Games. Um, it's a steampunk low fantasy adventure, partly designed about answering the question, can LARP be an art form? So a lot of our um, um, references and examples will be coming from that uh, from uh, that game. Uh, gentlemen, if you could also introduce yourselves. I'm Michael. I've been uh, involved in live action role playing since the late 90s, um, both as a player and organising um, systems. Currently organising a uh, post-apocalyptic uh, live role playing game called Afterfall, which should be coming out again uh, next year, and um, yeah, it's happening. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Gareth. Um, I've been involved in LARP for more years than I probably want to admit. Um, again, both as a player and as an organizer, um, most recently I was involved in the, the Zeppelin Games project, which was great fun, and I also have run some of the early Swordcraft Quest games. Um, in the last couple of years, I've taken some time off the hobby because uh, I had to write a thesis and had a baby, but those are not done, and I'm excited to get back into it. It's finished. It's finished. Uh, I'm Joe. I also ran Zeppelin. I'm currently running a linear high fantasy uh, escapist lab called Watches of East Haven, which is very fun and not at all art. And uh, I've also been playing for since the late nineties, and I'm an educator by profession, so that's uh, informs a lot of where I come from. I would have been playing since the late nineties, but I was about this big, so they didn't let me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do want to comment briefly on the fact. Um, uh, yes, we are all white dudes. It's not necessarily representative of the hobby. Um, we just reached an unfortunate situation where um, all of the women in particular we would have invited, they're either busy, uh, <laughs> um, not, not, not really doing uh, artistic class uh, based on their, their design briefs. Uh, well, we didn't really know them uh, very well, so it's, um, don't feel that this is representative or any kind of indication of, of barriers and things. Um, if you do want to get involved, please do approach us and approach the hobby. Uh, is open and accessible and growing more and more so all the time. That brings us uh, to our first slide. What is LARP and what is art? Uh, as most of you are all hobbyists, you, you will already know role playing is a, is a shared fantasy and live role playing for the purposes of our discussion is um, a shared fantasy where each character is represented by uh, a, a person acting out that role. It's, it's live. Um, in particular though, uh, not, we're not talking about like educational and training arts like the military or you might do in school. Um, we're talking about stuff that you're doing mainly for escapism and, and for fun and for entertainment. Um, that might involve some unfun or some educational elements, but that's not the main place that we're coming from. It is a sort of exploration of the entertainment value of it. Um, and for art, this sounds uh, highly subjective, but this is the... This is the, the phrase that we're, we're going to be working on. Art creates genuine feeling and connection in the audience by conscious design. So for a lot, the uh, audience is primarily the players, but it's also um, anybody 
anyone who's there, any, anyone who's playing a non-player character as well. So, um, and it's why conscious design is probably the most important part of this this, this concept phrase. Um, like a sunset is beautiful, but unless you believe in uh, intelligent design, it's not necessarily something that's been done consciously. Uh, to take a photograph of that, that becomes art because you've made the conscious decision to attend to a photograph feeling. So that's where we're going to uh, in this lab. And just to just to bring that sort of grounded, do we do we have any examples of, of labs which have approached that concept? Um, there was one that was run a few years ago called um, the Long Walk. And one of the things that that um, lab did was it very consciously wanted us to establish connections between the characters before the game. It's a once-off game, it was only going to be run one weekend and then never run again, but we workshopped the characters beforehand so they became more real for us as we were playing through the experience. So that was one from a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I have an example that comes from a game that I ran, I didn't play. Uh, in Zeppelin games we had a storyline that involved a um, uh, a, a murderer, a serial killer, and some detectives that were trying to track that serial killer down. And it was very much just sort of a procedural uh, crime thing from event to event. But uh, as it went along, we deliberately increased the foreboding, made the threats more and more personal until, uh, in the end, we sort of kidnapped and murdered our detective. <laughs> uh, with consent. With consent. <laughs> with consent. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to talk about a game that I played uh, a couple of years ago called Murder on the Gun, or last year? This year? Was, Start was this year. year. Next. This year. Uh, which was a game in which the designers deliberately attempted to deconstruct the form. So you would start and you were given characters in the 1950s uh, on the train, on the gun, to Darwin, and then uh, those characters then played a game set in the 1920s, it was a supernatural murder mystery, and then we were given more character sheets that said, oh, you're not really a 1950s housewife playing a supernatural werewolf detective, you're actually a KGB spy <laughs> pretending to be a 1950s. <laughs> and then... You get another piece where it goes, guys, the gun didn't go to Darwin in the 50s. <laughs> it's all bullshit. Uh, and then I yelled at the designers for a while. <laughs> Which was their intention. You know, what happens when you can't trust your GMs? What happens when your GMs lie to you? Uh, it's very similar to, I don't know how many people have played... Um, what's that game that just came out about playing a million games from a guy that doesn't really want you to play them? Beginner's Guide? Yeah, that's the one. Beginner's Guide uh, actually reminded me a lot of the movie. <laughs> that's my example. Yeah, some people still think they're playing it. Um, I will shank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my example, uh, it, it, it doesn't even need to be that complicated either. It's, it's all about, as long as, as a designer you know, or, or an organizer or a writer, you're trying to create that connection. It doesn't have to be complicated. One of our players at Zeppelin, um, we decided that what she needed out of the next event was something you know, solid and achievable and accomplishable and, and that would make her, make, her, make her feel proud of, of her, the work that she was doing as an engineer in this wacky steampunk dystopian world. Um, so we gave her an engine to put together. She had a, a ball and really felt that she'd gotten something done. So we, it, it doesn't need to be complicated uh, or, or deep or mm, feeling emotions. Or, um, to to be art, as long as you are deliberately evoking the feeling and, and making that happen. I think this one's for you, Gareth. <laughs> um, okay, so the, I'm just going to talk about some terms here and define some shared vocabulary so that we can continue this panel and everybody's going to know what we mean. So if I say the word free form, it will make sense. Yes. So why don't we just uh, start with freeform and just work in a clockwise fashion. <laughs> so freeform in this sense describes a game format. It's very much uh, a sandbox type environment. So uh, you can think uh, Skyrim, where there's just an open landscape that you would run around and interact with, and occasionally things will pop up and happen, but 
the order that that happens in is completely up to the player. And this is compared to a linear game, which is a pathway model. So we use our path, and on that path there is a string of encounters, and the path can do everything the path can do, so they can walk, they can look back, they can do all sorts of tricky things. But essentially, it's somebody telling a story that you're getting to experience rather than crafting your own story. So a nice example of winning a game is like the Bioshock model. You basically just don't have much of a choice. Uh, okay, moving through. Organizers are the people that run games. They're the ones that write the games, put the things together, bring everything into peace and actually make it possible. And this is different from the game master, who is like the referee or the umpire inside the game. And These the are, And the person who makes it uh, And one can do that in that. <laughs> I don't really want the organizer to do that. We just want the GM to arbitrate it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have NPCs, which are the... Uh, there's a whole panel in what is an NPC. But essentially, it's the same as a computer game. So they're the... Characters that are not run by players, they can be anything between a person that stands there with an exclamation point above their head ready to give out a plot to a fully developed character that will interact with you. Um, and character. together, organizers, NPCs, and game masters make the crew, they're the staff that run these games. Okay. Um, I, I'm not going to define our. We did that. Okay, we're in character and out of character. These are also sometimes called in game and out of game, or uh, off game. Off game. Yeah. So what that means is that when you're in the game, you have a character on, and you're interacting as your character. You're in character. When you're as a player speaking, you're out of character. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Unless anyone has questions, like that's clear, right? Yeah. The next question we wanted to sort of ask to, to frame this is: Are all LARP games up? No. No. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> uh, no, because the thing is that to be art, uh, you know, the, the key thing is that conscious design. You have to be saying what I'm doing is I'm trying to create an emotion. I'm trying to build this this. Uh, shared space and it's going to be an emotional one and it's full of connections and I'm going to do those things. And just whereas there are or I mean you can run a game that goes, actually no, this is just escapism. We're just gonna go and run around and have some fun. Or we're just gonna hit each other with foam swords or we're gonna find out who's the best at hitting people with foam swords. Uh, which are all great, right? Uh, I've had loads of fun finding out who's the best at hitting people with foam swords. Um, Usually it's the guy with the big shield, but that's okay. <laughs> the, the art love can be a wonderful art form. It can also be just escapism, and that's okay. That's, that's my answer to the question. It's a good answer, but thanks. Um, it's not exclusive, though, to uh, games that are deliberately designed to be art. Some games can have art, but really artistic and deep moments. Um, and some really artistic games can have some kind of naff, naff ones. It, it varies a lot. Mm -hmm. Overall, what kind of effect does Arthur Lab have on the player experience? <laughs> um, generally, it should have a positive one. So you're there to have fun, so the idea of having a well-designed Arthur Lab is to enhance the experience. The way in which it does it is actually quite interesting, though. Um, who here watches Game of Thrones? Keep your hand up if you hate Joffrey. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. That show has created an emotional response in its viewers. It has created loathing within its viewers about a certain character. It's had creative choices of how to present that and how to represent it in that medium, and it has had an effect. Within the live roleplay, as you go through as a player, how you interact and how the game interacts with you can create that um, response. It can be a wide range of responses. You can be happy, prideful, uh, all these different things, um, but it, allows you to be immersed into that game. Um, and a lot of the times you will care about the game because for you it is more real. There is not just the five senses, you can see it, you can hear it, you can um, 
taste the difference in food. But it creates that emotional con uh, context, a sixth sort of sense about how um, this game is running. And um, it, yeah, a wider palette of experience for you as a player within the art of the With the point about caring about the game, that's actually quite a strong thing. Everyone who plays a game wants to have their experience continue and strive and survive. So they want their character to live. You don't want to consider losing your character. However, we've seen in games that we've played in and run, people are willing to sacrifice their character for other things because they feel it is worth it. They feel a connection to other players, to game elements, to fictional nations that never exist, to all these sorts of things. And they want to have that continue through. So they want to give up their play experience to end a character's story to do that. That can be quite a powerful tool to allow within the game design and the, the shared experience that we have. Um, one of the games, well, the last game that I was involved with running was After the Fall. Um, Post-apocalyptic game, it got a bit crazy at points, but the players were really, really involved in that game to the point where I haven't really seen that at any other game we've been in, in Australia. The, uh, they trusted in the game system. We gave them a game and an environment which allowed them to do that, allowed them to um, demonstrate their creativity, and they've responded. One of the issues with that, though, is there's a concept called bleed. In character and out of character crossover. If you're having a really bad morning, and you go play a character, your character's probably going to have a bad morning, because there is that crossover there. Um, within this game, though, it was bleed from the environment to them. So the in-character world in which they inhabited, which we created and tried to make real to them for this 48-hour period, they missed it. They really, really missed being in this terrible, terrible place <laughs> <laughs> where we gave them, like, terrible food. <laughs> well, good uh, Watered-down beer, and oh. people were trying to kill them. There was radiation and plagues and all this sort of stuff. They missed that world because they were enjoying it and it was real to them. To the point where one of the um, one of the players uh, works in retail and someone went to hand him like on the next day went to hand him money and he went, No, I want beans. I want <laughs> beans. <laughs> this is what the um, one of the aspects can be, which means that it needs to be made aware that this happens, understand that it's a natural part of the game, and then support that um, element from the organisers, from the crew. Don't stigmatise it, make sure that there's, if people are too emotionally involved, that they can opt out of the game, that the, um, the mechanisms are there to allow safe play within that environment. If you're going for deep emotion, then that's even more important. If there's uh, tragedy and loss and all these sorts of things, because that can also impact on real world issues if someone has had family loss in their real life and in the game their mother dies, it can definitely blur over that line. So there's the side effect of Artful Art is to make sure that we are all responsible as organisers and have a junior care to our players. Is that, can I just add one quick thing? Yeah. One other effect is that Artful Art, I believe, makes a better game. Because as a player, you your emotions are deliberately engaged, so you engage with the game more. I, I just think it's a richer and more fun, it's potentially more fun experience, more rewarding. Especially for the type of game that we all seem to like playing, so that's the type of game that we run. Right. Yeah, it's not me. <laughs> not you. <laughs> what, what, kind of, what kind of games do you like, running Joe, and how do they compare to other formats of games? <laughs> 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 what does that say? Um, Excellent segue, but I actually wanted to go back to the last one for a second. <laughs> because I wanted to talk about the role of rituals in that. Ah, um, okay. Because actually there's, a, there's some tricks that you can use, and some really cool tricks that you can use. And uh, For example, in Watchers, every game you turn up, and if you're playing that morning, then what you'll do is you'll put on your costume, and then you'll wait with the other people who are playing, and you will sit together out of character. And then someone will come to you and they'll say, all right, in five minutes we're going to be in character. And then they'll come to you again and they'll say, all right, cool, we're going to be in character, here's where you are. And then they'll walk you into the game world 
and you'll walk into the market. It's always the market first, and then it's always the briefing. Because in my game, you're fantasy cops. It's great. Um, fantasy cops. Don't it's not solving little fantasy crimes. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's always first the market, then the you go see the side. And that always happens, and then they, they get eased into their characters. Uh, they'll come, and at the end, you know, they'll go off and they'll solve their fantasy crimes or defeat the invaders or whatever, and then they'll come back and they'll meet that sergeant again. They'll go back to the sergeant, they'll tell them the story in character, here's what happened, and then they'll take off parts of their costume, and then they'll sit down with a GM, and they'll tell the GM in character, uh, out of character what happened. And they'll talk about it from a meta point of view. And so you ease people in, and then you ease people out. And we do that to because we're fun, escapists. So we don't want people to bleed too much. And so we have these little rituals to, to avoid that. Uh, and we don't have people walking out of their house on Monday morning going, fuck, I'm on art. <laughs> which also happened from Which us. happened? Yeah. I did. I was in, in danger of that. <laughs> I was running the yeah. and um, I'm yeah. I was going to add okay. one little point to that. The rituals don't have to be a function of the game, they can be a function of the player. So, uh, for example, uh, I used to have a ritual with some of my friends. We'd go to these event, uh, these weekend long events, uh, Philosopher's Guild, and we were trying very much for inner immersion. We are trying to be in character all weekend. So at the start of the game, we'd look at each other and say, see you at the end of the weekend. Like that, that was our ritual to go, we're now in play. Mm -hmm. And that, that gave us very definite bookends. And I think that's on that topic, the, a bunch of different players doing the same ritual is also a powerful thing for a shared experience. Mm -hmm. So everyone can have their own individual little thing, but if you're sharing that part of the game with other people, that becomes powerful and important. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do need to hurry up a bit. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so well, back to my segue. <laughs> All right, we'll pretend that you can see it. great. Um, all right, so we have three things that I really like in games, and maybe this is just me, but it's interactive. I, I like, I want, you know, to make a game, as opposed to a movie or a book or a sculpture or a painting, a game is interactive. You can make choices and you can affect the outcomes. Uh, if, what you're, if you don't have the chance to change the outcome, if you don't have the chance to fail, if you don't have the chance to make choices, then that's probably not a game. Um, and there's a panel in that, but okay. Yeah. Uh, the next one is immersion, where you you lose yourself in the game, right? You you involve yourself. You go, all right, no, I'm I'm in the game world now. Um, and the next one is collaboration. And so while there've been great works of art in video games. There have been works that create lasting emotion. There have been, you know, like I played this war of mine earlier this year, and that one stuck with me for a long time. It's still sticking with me. Uh, and it's interactive and it's immersive, and you lose yourself, and you are a desperate survivor in a ruined house trying to keep your life together. It's not collaborative. I am playing through an experience that somebody else has designed and curated for me. I, you know, I can fail or succeed, but I'm very limited in my choices. So I can only do the things that are set by the designer that I can do. Right? And that's, that's okay. Out of that limitation, you get greater. And then my, you know, because when we play role-playing games, you, you think of three. You think of the tabletop role-playing game, the D&D, Dungeon World, and Fate, Pathfinder. Uh, you think of um, video game role playing, you think of Final Fantasy, this war of mine, all of us, and you think of LARP. And in tabletop role playing, you get that interactivity, you get to make your choices, you get to decide, ah, oh, you know, we're going to go down into the dungeon now. Uh, yes, I'm going to try and uh, ruin that guy's life because he won't let me be the prince of the city. Whatever. <laughs> he did. Uh, yes, I'm going to sacrifice myself to let everyone escape. Those, you get your interactivity and you get collaborative because in a tabletop game, you are not... The, the story isn't just told to you by the all-seeing, all-powerful person. 
you affect the story and you change the story. And that the story that comes out of a good tabletop game session is a collaborative story. It's a shared experience. Uh, what that doesn't do is it's not immersive. You are sitting around the table telling a story together. You're not really, you don't feel like you're the guy, right? You don't feel like you're the, the paladin. You're just telling the story of the paladin. Uh, what LARP does is all of those things. So you are, you're telling a collaborative story, all of you together, and you get to control your character. You know, you, you are the only one who tells that character's story, and you tell it from inside their head, and you tell it immersively. Uh, you tell it while immersed in that character. So that's uh, why it's better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and <laughs> when, when you're designing a LARP, there are different... Um, Different design elements have different effects on the, the way that the, the game plays out. Like in a computer role playing game, frequently will um, equate a linear narrative style with the, the more evocative and, um, and deep storytelling. Whereas in a, in a live role playing game, frequently it's the other way around. You want a, a, free, a more free form environment that it will tell more powerful stories. That sort of brings us to our next slide. Master of the Art of the Segway. That was very forced. Yeah, that, that one wasn't so good. Not that one. Um, is it? How do you actually create a LARP game? The short answer is by making deliberate design choices and following our definition of art, basically. Our um, definition. This is our definition, so yeah. we need to explain and command David. Um, but you can only make these design decisions based on comparison. Either you subvert, you copy, or you avoid things that you've done and seen. And it doesn't have to be in a live role-playing game where, you, where you're learning these lessons from. It can be in other mediums. Um, you do have to know your medium. You play lots of games, right? Mm. Uh, uh, absolutely. I actually have a rant here. Something oh. that makes me angry. But it essentially <laughs> boils down to what kind of filmmaker doesn't watch films? What kind of author doesn't read books? So if you want to run one of these games, go to these games and go to all of them. Good and mm. bad, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you can learn from bad things. And learn other things, other mediums as well. I think there's lessons to be learned in um, all sorts of related hobbies. Like if we look at the video games, the computer games that Joe was talking about earlier, I think that they have absolutely mastered the task reward feedback loop far beyond any of these other forms of game. And rent. Yeah. Also, you need to make sure that. Um you have an audience that has new players. <laughs> I never want the audience. <laughs> well, as, aside from that, like, what are some tools we can use to, to make our design choices is probably the next uh, question that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, Gareth, our resident academic, has uh, a few things to say on this topic. I do. There's actually a whole lot of research has been done into this. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this is actually a massive field, so I'm just going to briefly touch on some uh, more crunchy game design aspects, just sort of to give you a glance at what it is, and if you're some more interested, come and talk to us later or whatever. So the first concept I want to talk about is the threefold theory. This came out of tabletop role-playing theory, the indie game scene, so it's called the, the GNS theory. It was designed by Ron Edwards. He's since abandoned it. Um, and moved on to other theories, but in LARP, I think it still definitely applies, and I think it's really good. What does GNS stand for? Okay. <laughs> so, G so G GNS is three types of game and three broad motivations that people might want to play your game. One is gamist, so people who want to win. One is narrativist, people that are interested in stories. One is simulationist, the people that are interested in simulating other realities. How or or. or whatever it is, the shared imagined space you want to simulate. In LARP, this isn't quite right. It's actually GNI, where I is immersionist. And actually, we've extended it to GNIA, where A is adventure or uh, exploration. We're interested in exploring this world because we actually get to be part of it. Um, and the reason that that's good is because unlike tabletop role playing, when you're just dealing with half a dozen players or whatever you have. You have a large number of players, and so you have to start dealing with sort of statistical motivations. So uh, 
we end up in something that I call collaborative player crew game quantity maps. And like essentially what you do is you look at it and you say, <laughs> well, if, if a fifth of our players are playing this for gamest reasons because they want to win, then shouldn't I spend about a fifth of my development time writing a gamest games and catering for that? Can we get to the questions at the end? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I promise you, I did, I did. <laughs> um, And the, the answer to that question, like, you shouldn't, I match the percentages uh, or the fractions or whatever in the maths uh, has to do with your game master style, like your, whether you're a passive or an active game master. Are you passive in the sense that you're very reactive and you're going to let them, um, let the players do what you want and uh, answer that, or are you going to be active and push it on to them? Uh, the serial killer starts looking at the detective, you know. Um, and the concept that I want to discuss there, which is that sort of passive to active game mastering style, as well as this GNI business. These aren't binary switches. These are faders, if you want. So, wait, uh, and this is going to lead us to something we call the LARP mixing board. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> this thing is a framework for organizing your thoughts and your design decisions about a LARP or actually any creative agenda. Uh, it was originally developed in one of the European LARP writer summer school workshops and there is a whole panel on this, but briefly the concepts are you take a look at each of the sliders and you decide where you want to set them. So we could look at the player skill versus character skill slider, so uh, skill with a sword. Is it more important that my player is good with a sword? Or is it more important that my character is good with the sword? And you can tweak the game to encourage either of those. Um, now, what we've seen is that if a player wants to play a game that, and that has very different choices on this board, because players come, perhaps without knowing, desiring some setting on the mixing board, and if that desire doesn't match your game, they're not going to have a good time. But it's just... That's how it is. However, as organisers, you will hear about it a lot. Oh, you yes. will? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, the next stage is about the implementation of these choices. So, we've made all our choices on our mixing board, and how do we implement that? And this is how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it feels. Okay, so at its heart, organising one of these games is the act of communicating a vision and a social contract with the other participants to make that vision happen. So let me say that in a different set of words so it's more clear. I as an organizer have a vision of the game that I want to run and I'm going to enter into a social contract which I think should become explicit, an implicit social contract with my other participants to play that game. Um, so what we're going to do is we sit around and we say, let's play a game together, that's the contract. Um, can I just add something there? So no, specifically, the contract isn't just we're going to play a game together, the contract is we're going to play a game about uh, journalists in uh, steampunk world in uh, yeah. quasi-Victorian England. If you turn up to that and you go, oh, no, actually I want to play a knight with a sword, then that's a breach of that social contract. Everyone's going to have a bad time over that. Absolutely. Absolutely, they are. Um, however, there's, there's two aspects to this implementation. The first is the vision, the second is the contract. So let's talk about the vision first. Um, so the question is, how do I communicate my vision into the group so that we can have a communal vision, the thing that we're all actually going to do that approaches what I want to do originally? Um, in tabletop role-playing, there is a principle called the Lumpley Principle that says, if it is never said or heard, it doesn't exist. So when you're sitting around playing D&D with your friends, if you think in your head, oh, I totally draw my sword and I'm ready to jump this guy from behind, but you never say it, then it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. The same thing exists in law, except that, as Mick said earlier, we're not limited to one sense. It's not only verbal. So if you don't do it, if it doesn't happen in front of players, in front of players, 
and it didn't happen. Yeah. So, using this, we can communicate this vision, my vision, the game I want to run, to my players in two ways. We can do it directly or indirectly. So, directly is by talking to them and by showing them. So, crew briefings, um, NPCs is what I want you to do. Uh, briefings with your players to set expectations, like the long walk that Nick was talking about earlier. Uh, setting briefings, you know, here is your mythos, describing the world, and so on. Debrief afterwards, um, particularly for ongoing games. And we can also communicate it indirectly, and this is through showing them, not by telling them. So, doing this through intermediary NPCs, via props. So if I prop my world richly, I'm setting an expectation and communicating what I want this world and this game to look like. Um, you can do that with the nature of repair. So there's a whole bunch of techniques here. I don't want to spend a whole hour talking about it. <coughs> what will I spend time the Yeah. Um, when it says if it doesn't happen in front of the players, it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that you have to have everything in front. If there's a big explosion off screen, have someone come in and describe that in front of the players. It means that it exists. Yeah. Because it's a part of their experience. They understand that this thing has occurred. Yeah. We don't have a budget to do a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so you can reference it. But it's also, part of their experience. turns out that people won't let you burn down the hospital. No, I know they won't want to burn down the hospital. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's you briefly, can't do that in the bush. Let's briefly talk about social contract. So the social contract is, let's play a game. How do we play it? And what are we playing? Uh, there's kind of three broad aspects here. and. The first is, how in an out-of-character sense, as a participant of this game, do I interact with other participants of this game? So we have levels of behavior and so on. Um, this can be formal, like Watch the Least Hate Joe's game has a, an actual harassment policy that says we expect you to behave to other participants in a certain way. Or it can be informal, just if you to want to, you can get a shared culture. And to give it to you, it's fine. Yep. Uh, we also have how in character do I interact with other characters of the game, so an internal thing. And this is where the, the nature of NPCs come up. So are they real characters? Are they just plot spawning sprites? Um, and there's a third fuzzier level which is how as a participant do I interact in character? And to make that clear, I've, I've got an example. So there's a Love going on at the moment, it's an L5R love. Does anyone here know L5R? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a samurai fiction, it's great. And in this, there are a trio of players, they're playing lions, so Matthew, fierce warrior women. But they have an out of character agreement that they will never abandon or betray each other. So this is an out of character agreement added onto their personal social contract that constraints their in-character behaviour. Okay. That's, that sort of leads us on to a point that um, we, we got up on the, the board about. <laughs> <laughs> when the participants in a game add on something more, sometimes it's good for the game, sometimes it's bad for the game, but they have that freedom to do so. How do we, how do we balance those the things, designer intent and, and participant agency? Actually, I have a rant about this. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm please. It's like we planned it in advance. Right away. Uh, so there's a thing where a bunch of people sit down to play a collaborative game where they're all going to tell a story together and their social contract is, oh, we're going to tell a story together. We're going to have the freedom to each affect the story. And then afterwards, the dungeon master bitches to his friends, cannot believe those players ruined my plot. Mm. <laughs> Write a book. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't want your players to change your plot, then write a book. If you don't want, or a video game for that matter, limit them. Or, or tell them in advance. Yeah, make it clear to them if that's what you're doing and if they're happy with it, go. Guys, we're going to play a game where you're all on rails and you have to do what I tell you, but you'll get to roll dice and you'll get to decide which sword you want to swing and blah, 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 blah. But I'm going to tell you what decisions you want to make. And if your players want to play that game, then more power to you and to them. But I don't, if, you're, if you go and you say, we're going to run a collaborative live role-playing game, you don't get to make that pitch. You don't get to go, oh, they ruined my plot. No, they played your game. And if they wrecked it, then you wrote it poorly. 
I have a, a, a point I actually just want to attack on the end of you. I absolutely agree with Joe. I think collaboration is a strength of the weakness, but I want to know strength, you, uh, strength of the medium. But, yeah. but I think it, but I think it looks like a weakness mm. because one of the things about collaboration is you very seldom get to do a second draft. You rarely get to go over again. And there's a very well known uh, effect, effect, uh, uh, thought in thesis writing that says the first draft of anything is crap. So what that means is our collaborative games look bad, even though they're not. And I'm going to remind you all of the lightning bolt guy, right? <laughs> lightning bolt, lightning bolt. Everyone in that game was acting collaboratively. They were having a great time. It's just on the outside that it looks bad. <laughs> that was probably really epic for everyone involved. Yeah. Right? Because if you're there in that situation, then you're going, oh man, it's like I'm mean, throwing lightning bolts everywhere. Fuck me, that guy has a lot of lightning bolts. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, holy crap, he's blowing up the monster go fella. Yeah. And then you watch it on video and you're like, ooh. Never yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. this, this is why we don't allow it. Not a spectrum. Because you lose all the immersion and then you lose the magic. Yeah. The, the next one on the slide was about the role of rules. I think that was something else you wanted to talk about, Joe. I did, but honestly, I feel like the next bit is more important, and yeah, that right. doomsday clock is scaring me. The short version goes like this. Rules are important, and they should set the restrictions that you need, and they should support the story and the kind of game you want to tell. If you have a 90-page rulebook and 60 pages of it use combat rules, then your players are going to think your game is, you know, two thirds combat. That's what it is. If you have, so if you want your game to be about the story, then your rules need to be about the story. That's it. Um, there's a really good panel uh, by a bunch of like, two guys. It's called Beyond D and D. Um, if you want to learn more about how rules can affect the game that you run, that's actually just a really good summary of it. And again, if it's all kind of talk to me. I'll rant for hours. In, 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 I will. Um, in the indie role playing game scene is rich with rules. Theory. Mm. Um, the next uh, next question we wanted to ask about is this this thing called layers of game. This is a bit of a complicated uh, concept, but um, yeah, Game of Thrones. We've all seen Game of Thrones. There's this example again. Um, you know how there's all this interweaving and, and, and delicately structured stories that don't seem to cross over a whole lot. I mean, they might have sort of an incidental effect on uh, each of the other stories that are going on, but they're all they all kind of stand alone for the most part. In a, in, a in a live role-playing game, there's a very similar experience. You've got uh, the, the play experience of just, just discrete players at discrete times are frequently going to be very, very different. Um, so one of the things that we, we do is we try and identify and, and pick and favour each of these games within games to foster and, and which ones to kill. Um, because you don't want a wacky fun time adventures um, game within your game if you are going for gritty realism and vice versa as well. Um, we ourselves have been guilty of, of this on occasion. Right, Joe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. No, uh, when we started Zeppelin, we weren't quite sure, you know, we are like, ah, oh, we want a really emotional game, we want, to, we want to do art, we want to make our players really feel connected, we want to really, you know, get involved and da 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 and then kill them. And, we, and then kill them at the end. Uh, most of them. But then the um, we were running a steampunk game, quasi fantasy Victorian era sort of land. And in our first game, we had a villain called Baron Von Evil who twirled his mustache and had wacky schemes. He, had a big red he did have a big red button. He would tie people to train tracks. And at the end of our first game, people went, "What the fuck was that?" <laughs> Uh, You've got to cut that guy. And I'm like, but he's really fun to play. And then like, yeah, he's yeah. And, and so your game. And so we did cut it. And we, part of part of when you're designing uh, one of these like, a whole arc with intent behind it is that you need to make decisions like that. You cut things because they're not fun, because they're not matching the artistic vision that you and your design team and your players have collaboratively. Um, yeah. So Baron von Eagle was really fun for me to play as a GM and a writer. And so he was a self emergent thing. Like, if you, as a GM, want to insert your little pet characters in, uh, don't. <laughs> but also, you know, put them in the, in the crosshairs. Make sure that those guys, you can just get rid of them. 
anything that the GM does, like, they should be cut if it's wrecking your game for your players, or if it's not good for your game as players. And so, yeah, you really like playing that guy, okay, cool, go play a different, play your play games, you know, get your play somewhere else, because here your responsibility is to run the game. Um, there's a term that I've heard in screenwriting as well as computer game design, uh, you need to be prepared to kill your babies. Mm. You can love something to death, it's this beautiful game element, element it's elegant, it's beautiful, it's going to be amazing, but it just doesn't fit in, get rid of it. Your game is stronger for removing elements that will not fit into the rest of the game. Yeah. Wow. And so that sort of takes us to the end of the formal part of that panel. We'll be opening up for questions in, in after after we make this in that last little set of points. But you know, as as in a high school essay, we want to sort of wrap everything up with a conclusion on it. We have touched on everything really shallowly, unfortunately. The amount of time that is available on these panels is just too small. It's too small. Um, but to sort of sum it up, there are there are three essential steps. So the first one is to make those decisions. You're making your conscious decisions about. Where would you set in each of those faders? Um, I think that's probably where Gareth is right now with his next project. Yeah, that's right. So as I said, I've taken a bit of time off when I'm coming back. So at the moment, as far as the games that I'm running, I'm at this stage, I'm, I'm behind that mixing desk playing the sliders. I have a number of different game visions that I'm pretty excited about, and I'm trying to get them very concrete in my mind and make decisions about those before I go any further. So that's where I'm at. Once you've done, once you've got those those phases set, you start to implement decisions and figure out how you might do that. And Mick, that's probably where you're at, right? Yep. Um, after the fall, we ran a what was going to be a once-off game earlier this year. It was kind of coming once off. <laughs> um, very well received by the players. So we're in the process of changing that, changing its format for an ongoing game. It's a very different um, way you structure a once-off game. You can afford to do a lot of things. You can kill the town. You can do all sorts of things. In an ongoing game, it doesn't work as well. So restructuring the game and making new decisions for a new artistic uh, focus um, under a different format. So we're having to change a few things up. Yeah. I, I'm also in a similar spot myself, uh, collaborating with Mick on a side project called Forgotten Tomorrows about um, how to uh, uh, how to well uh, well to do middle class people deal with uh, the breakdown of civil society and how do you perform. Uh, how do you live your life in a, a sort of civil war and violent situation? Very similar to this um, work mind love. Very, very yeah. similar to that game. Yeah. So we're we're trying to figure out how to implement those decisions, particularly with regard to bleed and safety and things. Um, and then once you've got your decisions made, you run it, and then you look at it again on a permanent basis, and you say, "Well, did that work? Did this did this work?" That's probably where you are, right, John? Yeah. Um, I'm running Watches of East Haven, which is fun. And we have a game next <laughs> Saturday. If you want to book in, put a thing. Yep. Ta da! Ta da! <laughs> so yeah, come play my fantasy club. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, next game, 6th of November, it's at Darabin Parklands. Uh, that's, that's you can Facebook the Watchers of East Haven, you can email us at Watchers of East Haven. It's, it's not plugging for it. Watchers of East Haven at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> or you can come and talk to me afterwards, that's fine too. Yeah, and um, realistically, the best answer was your next is get involved. Um, we have a bunch of different contacts here, and uh, just as a reminder, basically anyone can do this. It's um, something that we, a uh, hobby that we want to grow. It's a niche hobby, and our particular area within it is kind of niche, uh, and, and we want to see that expand and grow. So um, I will be wearing this hat for the rest of the day, <laughs> as well as some other costume, so I will be readily identifiable, but you can probably pick out the other guys in the crowd as well. Um, and that brings us, I think, to questions. Uh, first of all, you did have a question earlier, and we... Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. okay. Um, it's a good theory. <laughs> did you have a question, sorry? Was that a hand up? No, we do Ben. Okay. Hey, Ben. Hey. 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 Uh, complete accident. 
So just, just for the, the, the meat of that question was how do you be ready to improvise on the spot? Um, I think the, the short answer that I want to give to that is be ready to improvise on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> just stay on stay your toes. Like at the very first game we decided if our players decided to go off into the bushes, we would tear up the, the what we've written, throw it over our shoulders and just roll with it, make it up on the fly. But me and Joe both wanted to have a good one. Play lots of games. <laughs> You yeah. have been in similar experiences, you know the genre, you know your medium, you know your craft. You can make up that. Um, yeah, and also know the world, know what's happening. You know, the reason Rob was able to play, to continue with the, you know, here's what happened to Ma, is because we knew everything that's happening around there. And because we knew that all of that was going to be happening, then Rob was able to go, ah, oh, so you have discovered our prop some hours before we were expecting any of the players to find it. Thanks, man. <laughs> um, but here's what's going on. We know this because when we wrote this encounter, we went, okay, here's what really happened, and then here's what the players will see. And then if they you know, do something unexpected, we've got all of that sort of ready to go. You know, if you prepare early, you sort of prepare a structure around which you can improvise. We, we also use radios to communicate between yeah, GMs and uh, have, and while it may occasionally look like everything's fine on the surface, there are ants going around in the background somewhere making sure that yeah, nothing breaks. Absolutely. And, and also I think, just to add on to what Joe was saying, uh, the more preparation that you can do, um, the better it's going to run. And so when you're setting up big set pieces like that murder scene that you uh, found this was in the procedural detective game. Um, one, you, you, when you're setting up a big set piece like that, you just have to ask yourself what happens if someone stumbles across this early? Mm -hmm. What happens if someone what happens? pushes the big red button? Yeah, yeah that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. And, and, so, so, another, and so, another example is that in the last game of Zeppelin, there was a doomsday lever. You pull the lever, the reactor will go critical and destroy the town or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, so we, we sat around, and we sat around mm -hmm. and went, what if someone pulls it too early? What if somebody walks up to the prop, sees might. the lever, and goes, you yeah. know, and, and they did? Yeah, and they did. <laughs> they did. I mean, you just sort of have to be prepared in such a way, like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Plan for the unexpected. Mm. Do, uh, yeah. Did a heavy one. Yep. Um, Fun. A lot of the time in last year, a lot of fun to be in, everyone's engaged, and fabulous and good at what happens when you get in-game bullies? Mm, okay. So just to repeat that question, if, if anybody can hear, what happens when you get in-game bullies? Um, I'm okay. going to leave that one open to you guys. Yeah. Uh, step one is to have a kick-ass harassment policy. Like, genuinely have an awesome harassment policy, put it up front in your rules. So whatever you give the players in the first little, you know, flick, flick, flick harassment policy. And then, and you have a waiver at the start of the game, make every player sign that waiver. And it says, you know what, if you breach our harassment policy, you're out. And then you come down hard, you have your GMs, you make sure that your player base feels safe talking to your GMs, you make sure that you've got multiple points of contact on the GM team, and you make sure that they are as diverse as you possibly can. There are I know, particularly, you know, it's an issue for me personally, because I know there are many female players who do not want to talk to a male GM about, um, you know, bullying issues or harassment issues. Fair enough. Make sure that you have a female point of contact for them. And you make sure that person will go, I will listen and I will talk to people and I will make sure something happens. And then when they do, you actually do. Yeah. Uh, and then you smack them. Yeah, when well, he says a kick ass harassment policy, he means a policy which will kick someone in. Yeah, so if yeah. If, absolutely. If I can add something to that. I think the best way to deal with bullying and other social problems within the game is to um, be professional about it. Mm. And by be professional about it, I mean what would happen 
in a convention like this if someone is going around bullying. What there will be a set of there will be a set of steps, mediation, realize we have a Did you mean things. in character or out of character? Uh, oh. Yeah, that's like done. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, oh yes, you can. Oh, you can. The middle yes. of the social contract. Absolutely, you can. So you sit down with the person, you talk to them out of character, and you say someone's got a problem with your character, and you apply that out of character consideration to in character actions. Yeah. You say your the way you are playing your character is hurting other people's game. And and you're, you're more gentle it. about it than you would be if they're doing it out of character, yeah. because often they don't realise that that's bad, or they don't realise But my character would do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right? That is the most annoying one. I know, right? Yeah. 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 Right? And you get that, and then you go, well, change your character, then, because your character is damaging the game. So either you change your character, or your character is going to not be allowed to come back. Yeah. One quick thing that's, that. that's what I did for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing on that. Essentially, with those sliders, yeah. it's one of those sliders. How hardcore the interplay between yeah. characters is going to be. Absolutely. If they're going against that, they're going against your design elements of the game. So, yeah. like any other thing that they're going against, tell them that it's not the game you're running. Or maybe you are playing that game. Maybe you're running that's a game, that's and that's okay. Let's move on to the next question. You, sir. <laughs> next question. Uh, I just wanted to add something to that point. Uh, one of the best ways I've found to convey uh, bullying is to say everybody's here to have their own fun. What you're doing here is making other people not have fun. Yeah. There are other ways for you to have fun. Uh, pick one. Pick, mm. yeah, pick, a, pick yeah. another way. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah that's just and because your character does this is not yeah. a good enough reason for everybody to not have fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So, uh, absolutely. We've already got a couple minutes left. Yeah, so, so let's see. I just want to say one oh, thing to the guy who asked about improvisation. There's a great book called Unframed, The Art of Improvisation for Jim Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's really a really good book. book. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. It's got there's some heavy material, but you can sum up most of it in a couple of flashcards that you can have on you while you're jamming these things. And, and you know, if somebody comes up to you and you can start to go, any other questions? Yeah. 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 You'll, have, you'll have a chance to talk yeah. to us later on, so we'll skip you. Your hand on up. That is one of the reasons that you need the multiple points of contact because somebody needs to be able to go to Rob and say Joe's fucking up. Uh, just very quickly for those people that couldn't hear, she's talking about GM showing favoritism mm. for out of character reasons to characters in the game. So when when designing your game and on an ongoing basis while running your game, everyone sort of just needs to watch the other organizers and GMs and all that sort of thing and keep in mind. Uh, are any of us playing favourites? Am I playing favourites? Are they playing favourites? Of course, you yourself are less likely to be able to spot it because of personal bias and stuff. But if everyone else is going, Rob, are you, are you handing that guy a thing? That's not okay, man. <laughs> pull, pull it in. Yeah. So, and, and inter, inter-organisational. Uh, so the the organisers have their own social contract. Yeah. 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 How do you, because it's a bit more complicated. Um, like, yep. With the harsh words. One thing that was Passwords in private. We'd be happy to do an entire hour talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want that next year? <laughs> yeah, tell every enforcer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our allotted time. They will kick us out very shortly. But again, yeah. please come talk to us. We're here. One or more of us will be here all the time. Absolutely. Um, and I'm looking for crew for my new project. And <laughs> up the back, doesn't exist yet. There's that guy, Phil. He has a handful of flyers for a group called Love Victoria. Check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.